continuing the case for the proposition, it gives me great pressure to introduce reader uh, in Renaissance history from Winchester University, Dr. Ellie Whitaker. My thanks to the president and to the committee for the invitation to join you this evening for this event. So the proposition here is that the House believes that monarchy is mere celebrity. As a historian, I'm going to be a bit boring and take the wider long durée view here and go a step further and say that monarchy has always been celebrity. Monarchy's long been with us from our earliest civilizations, from the pharaohs of Egypt, the kings of Sumeria and Assyria. Indeed, the history of China offers us several millennia of monarchical systems from the Chia dynasty in the third millennium BC until the end of the Qing dynasty in the early 20th century. Over all this time, monarchy could be seen as celebrity. Well, we can argue whether individual monarchs lived up to the idea that they were the most powerful, influential, or wealthy person in the lands they ruled over. They were indeed the most famous and visible individuals in the realm, even when most of their subjects never saw them in the flesh. While some monarchs toured their realms relentlessly on campaigns or moved in itinerant fashion around their domains, other monarchs never left their palace. And yet they were still seen. The face on the coin, the name uttered in the kutbah before Friday prayers, or listed in the proclamation posted in the marketplace. The monarch was everywhere. Their families were visible too, the birth of heirs publicly saluted and celebrated. Prayers recited for dead members of the dynasty. Royal brides welcomed in lavish <coughs> civic entries. Even royal women who were cloistered or hidden from view managed to be very visible, such as the female members of the Timrid or the Ottoman dynasties whose impressive acts of architectural patronage left a physical mark on the urban fabric of their empire's cities, building mosques, madrasas, and monuments that guaranteed their fame and ensured their name would be remembered and praised by generations to come. Okay, enough with the history lecture, you might be thinking, but stick with me for just a minute. So this visibility and fame led to a fascination with the lives of royals, charting their ups and downs, their personal and political peccadilloes, their poor sartorial choices. This is nothing the British tabloid press recently invented. The love lives of royal family members has long been generating ink on the page, from Caesar's dalliances with Cleopatra to Matthew Paris's allegation of King John stringing Isabella d'Angoulême's lovers up on the bedpost. Another great example is George IV's not-so-secret wedding to Maria Fitzherbert and then legal but disastrous marriage to Caroline of Brunswick. So if you think the modern monarchy is dysfunctional and scandal-ridden, you need only cast your eye back to the Hanoverians for some serious entertainment. Okay, so at this point, you might be happy to accept that monarchs and royals have long been visible and were undoubtedly famous, both in their own day and beyond, but you might ask, were they actually celebrities? Colleagues who work on the history of celebrity itself argue there's a difference between fame, renown, and celebrity, which they argue began only in the mid-18th century. Indeed, the royal families of the early modern and the modern era continue to be productive case studies for historians of both celebrity and monarchy, demonstrating how they're intertwined. Again, the Hanoverians, particularly the family of George III and the antics of the regent, later George IV, has been deeply discussed and developing work by new young scholars like Paige Emmerich and Natalie Garrett have demonstrated the celebrity nature of the Georgians in the popular press. Christina Jordan and M.K. Pollan have noted that scholars have seen an increasing age of royal celebrity that began in the 19th century, including Professor John Plunkett's study of Queen Victoria as the first media monarch. Edward Owens and Laura Clancy have taken this study into the 20th century and into the current reign, highlighting how the British monarchy used the celebrity status to craft their image in the modern media in the same way that Elizabeth I used portraits and progresses to fashion the image of Gloriana that endures today. Coming bang up to date to look at the youngest generation of royals as celebrities, Greg Jenner in his dead famous and unexpected history of celebrity notes that, quote, the Windsors have cunningly bolted the accessible aesthetics of celebrity to the ancient privilege of ancient royalty, creating a powerful hybrid that shields them from serious media intrusion, yet grants them a movie star glamour that makes them likable to a younger generation, end quote. 
So if we can agree that royals are indeed celebrities, it's now the question of whether monarchy is mere celebrity that we're left with. And this is where history comes in again to trace the evolution of monarchy from divinely appointed sovereigns or indeed even divine entities with untrammeled and absolute authority to the constitutional monarchs that we have today. I'm not gonna bore you with a rehash of the history of the early modern British monarchy from divine right and regicide to the restoration, the glorious revolution, the impact of the Bill of Rights on the monarchical authority, but we're all aware that the framework of constitutional monarchy has preserved the royal prerogative in principle, but privileged parliament to be the preeminent power in the realm, resulting in an increasingly powerless monarchy that reigns but doesn't rule. Effectively, what we can see from the glorious revolution to the present day is the fusion of issues, the fame and visibility of the monarchy being enhanced by the rise of modern notions of celebrity, while simultaneously their power and authority was being steadily diminished. Alongside or even part of all this is what scholars have called the demystification of the monarchy, as our monarchy and other European survivors have transitioned from being political to ceremonial with increasing commercialization, banalization, and desacralization. It's been argued that alongside the rise of everyday celebrities from reality TV shows or TikTok, we can see increasing trends of what's known as, quote, royal ordinariness, end quote where the greater accessibility of the monarchy from this demystification and their infusion of middle-class partners such as Catherine Middleton or Daniel Westling, the personal trainer turned spouse of the Crown Princess Victoria of Sweden, has increased media interest in the royal family and further enhanced their celebrity status. Effectively, what we've been left with as monarchy has lost its power but retained its theatrical and ceremonial aspect it's in is its intensive visibility, or indeed, being mere celebrity. But is being mere celebrity such a bad thing? It could be argued that we've kept the monarchy because it is mere celebrity. Pomp, circumstance, and tabloid fodder without the power that would make it a controversial political pu punching bag. And if we've given weight to democratic institutions in terms of political power, there's still a role to play for monarchy as mere celebrity. As Fred Inglis notes in his short history of celebrity, quote, celebrity is one of those adhesives which at a time when the realms of public politics, civil society, and private domestic life are increasingly fractured and enclosed in separate enclaves, it serves to pull those separate entities together and do its bit towards maintaining social cohesion and common values. So we can see this idea of monarchy's celebrity status providing a sense of social cohesion in the Platinum Jubilee celebrations that are going on at the moment. Thus, while monarchy has always been celebrity, and indeed could be seen as mere celebrity at this point in time, it still plays a key role in modern society precisely because of its intense visibility and its mere celebrity status. Thank you.